Gwyn Thomas takes you tonight to one place and one man who were an essential part of his upbringing, Ebu Vale and Anirin Bevan. First come the mountains on which the children play, content and lawless in their own strange realm, and these children will acquire a strange vision of life. Because in the clefts of these mountains, we have the power and turbulence of men dedicated to making their world stronger, more reliable, and dirtier. This is Ebu Vale, one of the most concentrated units of steel-making power in Britain. There is nothing in Ebu Vale but steel. It is the place associated with an iron bevan, statesman, orator, dreamer, wit. He took the image of this place out of the valleys in which he was born and presented it, its imperfections, its struggles, its humor, as a challenge to those parts of Britain that have never been scarred by poverty or the monstrous toll that heavy industry exacts from beauty. Look hard at these people, these streets, strung precariously around that central dark fist of steel making, and you will catch the echoes of that half impish, half angry irony that ran through the thought and the speeches of Bevan. The sheer problem of moving about on such slopes is considerable. Thirty years of swift movement up and down these streets develops leg muscles of a size that disqualifies one for the ballet and did much to bankrupt half-hour tailors who switched over to making pants for rhinos. There was no excitement to match that of us as children pelting down these tilting streets on winter nights down into the lighted town. But the journey up for the not so young could be a torment, and boys like the young and Irene Bevan must have earned more than one odd copper, pushing some decrepit citizen up to one of the top terraces. There was a lot to be said, we thought as babies, for taking out a permanent ticket in the pram. Once the man had his pub and the woman her kitchen, now we look back on that with the beginnings of a civilized smile. We wait for the smile to grow broader, but a climate of joy is harder to create than steel. From the moment man began to fiddle with his first furnace, he was like the sparks he created on his way upwards. To recreate the heat of the sun from which he sprang, that was the task. He could never go back to coolness and calmness after that. When he learned to blow the impurities out of iron, bubbling away at infernal temperatures, he had taken nature firmly by the hand, and the time was ripe for the vast pounding hammers that would beat out the tools and weapons of the modern age. To the children of South Wales, who grew up familiar with the sights of open furnaces making the night sky crimson, such works as these were the eyes of the world. And the men who worked in these places, we regarded, as did an Irene Bevan, not as faceless boobies discharging a menial task, but as giants fitting the destiny of man with the spine of a new strength and skill. There are few industries that call for such a marriage of technical genius and simple endurance. Over the last century, the men who make steel have sweated enough to put out all the fires on earth. To live in a half-molten, incandescent world drains the body of moisture, and man, being a watery animal, needs to have it put back. In the old days, the men were allowed to restore the balance with buckets of beer, but this practice ceased when it was found that workers with the larger type of thirst and the broader type of bucket took too flippant a view of the industry after the refreshment break. After a man has handled molten metal, treating it as casually as a boy would a glass of pop, life must be a bit of a letdown. I seem to see in the faces of steel workers, when they are relaxing at the day's end, a grave melancholy as if they had seen it all, as indeed they have.
Ebu Vale stands at the head of the valley. It is a confined place. To the south, you will pass through towns that sprang out of the writhing need for coal and steel, towns like Aberbeeg and Coombe, where the streets are like a petrified meringue, twirled out of plumb by the twists and turns of the hillsides. But to the north, there is an astonishing other world which we shall see in a minute or two. Down from the moorland come the wild ponies, creatures that roam the streets of Ebu Vale in a kind of democratic brotherhood with the citizens. And sheepdogs, foxed by living in a world half pastoral, half industrial, trapped by their neuroses into not knowing exactly what they are supposed to be rounding up. In this type of cricket, fielding is simplified. If the ball goes uphill, just wait, it'll roll back again. And if it rolls down the hill, just learn to play without the ball. And always the imaginative games of the young, as hot and creative if less prof profitable than steel mills. The bow and arrow brigade of Ebu Vale prepared to repel the approach of a traffic block spreading north from Newport. Here is a scout coming in with the latest report. It's always handy to have a subordinate mouth around if the stuff is not to your liking. The beginning of the moorland that stretches with hardly any interruption to the extreme north of Wales, east were the wagons, the signposts of the pioneers. It was here, over the moorland, that an Iron Bevan often walked. The moorland and the pub restored him after the tight oppressive rounds of political disturbance, and all the problems of fuel, power, movement and direction could for a moment or two be forgotten. This was the other side of his life, and one which explains his moods and con the contradictions that scurried across his life like clouds across a sky. For the men of the valleys live in two worlds. They know on the one hand the noise, the disfigurements, the failures of industrial men, and just up the hillside over the ridge, a pastoral calm that has never seriously been breached. Men like Bevan knew there is no going back to the simplicity, the reliable goodness of fern-covered plateaus, cloud fields, the companionship of animals, whom not even a politician needs to distrust. For it is not likely that the horse will be given the vote for some time yet. All the same, when a man has a paradise of trees and fields half an hour's walking distance from his own street, he is going to find it very hard to accept that street if it has sunk too far below the level of dignity and delight he expects for his neighbors and himself. Once you have heard the lark, known the swish of feet through hilltop grass, and smelt the earth made ready for the seed, you are never again going to be fully happy about the cities and the towns that man carries like a crippling weight upon his back. The library at Tredega. In these valleys in the days of Bevan's youth, a love of books rose as passionately as did the sound of singing. Men made their fumbling way out of darkened worlds with a lamp of words. A light distilled from the world's most compassionate dreamers. The men who did not wish to leave life as they found it, as long as there were still men, women and children still needlessly harassed, maimed and deprived. These then are some of the things that went to make up the personality and the image of one man in our age. The toughness of men in hard trades, the rural calm that hints of where man may have gone wrong in strengthening his industrial sinew, Streets poised at angles that grow less and less merciful as the energy wanes. Dreams of bodies made whole, lives renewed, heavens restored, rent abolished. The most startling amalgam of the angelic and the absurd. The mixture that glowed like pitch blend in the heart of an Irene Bevan and the best of his generation. The welling light of pity in the minds and eyes of children as they watch those who still toil onward from an ingrained loyalty to life 
though now bereft of the strength and grace they knew in the noontide of their days. <laughs>